All right, guys, it's time for me to say words. <laughs> Actually, Michael pushed them for me, so I don't have to. <laughs> so this is uh, Recruiting and Retaining Dedicated Volunteers. Uh, I am Stephanie Elhash, and I'm here to talk at you. So one of the things that I'm going to assume by having you all in the room here with me is you are a volunteer, you were a volunteer, you work with volunteers, or for whatever reason it appeals to you and you're looking to get into it. So we'll start there. As I said, I'm Stephanie. Um, I'm formerly of the Drupal, Drupal Association, and I did Drupal Cons. I was the program coordinator for seven of them, and uh, as program coordinator, my job was to work with volunteers to make the program part of DrupalCon possible. Um, Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm still smiling. So that, that should tell you one thing. So um, in my time working with them, which was three years, uh, I worked with people from all over the world, uh, multiple countries, and as Kathy mentioned, I'm still standing. So that should tell you something about my philosophy about what it is to work with volunteers. Um, before I worked with the Drupal Association, I worked for the Software Association of Oregon, and that is also a tech nonprofit. And I was there for three years, also working with volunteers. Um, I worked with about seven to nine different special interest groups, all putting on events, about 170 a year. So that's a lot of events. And then you add DrupalCon on top of that. So. I've got the chops. Um, so the things that I'm going to say to you come from a place of experience. They also come from a place of um, someone who has been burned or almost burned and has learned a lot of things. But the things that I've learned might not necessarily apply to you or in your situation. My background is events. Yours might be um, projects or issues or camps or whatever. Um, so the reason that I took the angle that I took on my talk was to be very general so that it wasn't just, here's how to run a DrupalCon, because for most of you, it's not really going to help. So the ideas that I'm going to share with you, definitely take with a grain of salt and also understand that what works for you and your team will be different. Let's get started. So when I say volunteers, when I say contributors, to me, it's this. It's really fun. Um, you're working with people who are kind of weird. When I first saw the pitch for, uh, for MidCamp and I saw the, the topic was Alice in Wonderland, the first thing I thought to myself was, well, obviously, we're bananas. Let's tell people about this. So this was the image that kind of came to mind uh, when I wanted to talk about volunteers. So that I'll use a couple of words interchangeably throughout my talk. Uh, volunteers, contributors, and team. For me, it's the same thing. First, I want to talk about what a volunteer is not. <laughs> this is from Downton Abbey. These are servants. When people are volunteering for you, they're doing it because they choose to. Their company might pay them. Some companies have a contribution set up so that you can work X number of hours per week, per month, whatever. But for the most part, people are contributing their time because they want to. And in this situation, even though it kind of looks the same, like you have a group of people coming together to do a thing, inherently it's totally different. And if you put yourself in a position where you treat your team like this, then you'll be in a situation where you don't have a team. You'll be in a situation where you're not going to be in that situation much longer. <coughs> this is one of my favorite teams that I worked with um, in the past. My DrupalCon Austin team um, that's pictured. They are what I would consider to be a really excellent team. This group of people came together and they contributed countless hours. I um, actually had them count their hours, so many of them contributed more than 40 hours over the course of about six months, which is a lot of hours if you have a job or a family or a social life. Like It's a lot of time that you're giving to a project or whatever. So this particular team came together and um, if you knew the people individually, you'll notice that they're not all from Austin. So this, this is all from DrupalCon Austin, but we have people here from London, uh, from Denmark. We've got someone from the Ukraine. Like They're from all over the place, but if you look at them, all you see is how much they look like they like being there. And if I tell you that it's 100 degrees outside and they're sweating their faces off, that just sort of adds to it. They're so happy. They really enjoyed working, and a lot of them actually came and continued working for DrupalCon LA. So a lot of them are still active, um, or will be active for DrupalCon Barcelona. So again, what Kathy said of 
did you survive? Not only did people survive, they're still coming back. When I first came on to the Drupal Association and uh, I would meet with the teams who did DrupalCon, they would joke and say, we should have a boff for all the DrupalCon planner survivors. And they don't joke about that anymore. So I think that's pretty great. This is DrupalCon Portland. This is our group photo. Um, in this photo are pictured, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say 3,300 people, but I don't know how many actually in the photo. Um, this is the Drupal community. And for me, this is an awesome photo of just how big that tiny group in Austin can be spread. In this photo, what you're seeing is people who, like I mentioned at the beginning, you're in the issue queues, you're leading events, you're doing Drupal meetups, you're mentoring other people, you're, you're contributing in some way to the project. And so all of these people, if they're not actually current volunteers, they can become volunteers. So just think about that base and just imagine how big that can be on a global scale. So I'm gonna start a story. Uh, this is called Stone Soup, and for me this really, uh, this is my idea of how contribution really works. Um, so Stone Soup has a couple of different origins um, from out the, throughout the world, but the point of it is um, what I will tell you. So the one that I know is, um, as it's post-war, a soldier comes to town, all he has is a cauldron, for whatever reason, apparently they gave them to soldiers, and a stone. And it's a war-torn village, everyone's poor, um, and no one wants to feed this hungry stranger who comes to town. So he sets up by the riverbank, puts the stone in the cauldron, fills it with water, and sets it to boil. And eventually someone from the town came to see what this weird stranger was doing, and uh, the stranger told him, I'm making stone soup, uh, but it's not quite finished. So the, the villager asked, well, what can I do to make this better? He says, oh, well, maybe if you have a couple carrots. And he's like, oh, I've, yeah, I've got a couple carrots. I can give you a couple carrots. And this kept happening as people from the village kept coming by to see what this madman was doing. And each person, as they came by, offered to give them something. No one wanted to give them everything that they had because everyone was poor and didn't have a lot to give. So instead, someone gave him some potatoes, some seasonings, whatever. Everyone gave what they were able, and at the end, they had this awesome stone soup that for the first time in many months, the entire village was able to eat this nourishing meal together. And to me, that's awesome. You had an entire group of people come together. They all wanted to keep what they had for themselves. And it was, co it was coaxed out of them to share what they were able to give. And together, they all came together and made something awesome. And to me, that's what volunteering and having a team is, is everybody brings what they're capable of and what they're able to share. And at the end, you have something awesome. And if you want to see other different versions, the internet has it. So now that we all know what a volunteer is, we know what a team is, now we have to figure out what we want to do with it. So odds are if you want volunteers, you want them for a reason, whether it is to plan an event or to put on a camp. You have your, your goal in your head. You have your, your cauldron and your rock. And now you have to figure out what it is you want to accomplish. And when you're looking for volunteers, that means that you yourself aren't able to do all of it by yourself. So you have to figure out what it is that needs doing, itemizing those things out and figuring out um, what kind of roles you can parse up and how you can package them so that someone else can come in and take it over. And once you figure out what those roles are, whether it's I need someone to do marketing or social media or someone to write the copy or someone to just show up and put chairs down, figure out what those things are before you go out so that you at least have a base. Because when people come to you, you'll, of course, grow your, your project. Then you need to go and find your people. So when you have what you need them to do, you need to find the right people for the job. So you're not gonna go find someone to run social media who doesn't know what Twitter is. I mean, hopefully, I don't know. <laughs> so when you go out there, you wanna have in mind what you're looking for. So that way, and I'm gonna come back to this a lot, is expectations and having what you want in mind is really helpful. So you'll go out, um, and you look for what I would like to call the perfect volunteer. So those of you who are unfamiliar, this is Samwise Gamgee from The Lord of the Rings. And to me, he is the epitome of like, the volunteer that any team lead wants. Um, if you have watched the movie, he never wanted to go on the journey to begin with. But by the end of the movie, he was the one who ended up taking up the ring and helping Frodo make it to the end. And he stepped up a lot. Um, one of the things that's really great about a good volunteer is that even if they don't come to you with the, I want to do it all, they have to come to you with the willingness of, I'll give it a shot. I'm going to try. Um, and if you don't have the skill set, if you don't have the qualifications, um, just having the willingness to figure it out or be taught will take you so far when you're doing this. 
Um, the other thing is that he was a really great fit for the team. So if you have to pick your volunteer, you want someone who is a great fit, willingness to uh, jump in and get their hands dirty, um, but also, and this one's kind of the clincher that can like, make or break a good volunteer, is availability. And it's one of those things that people don't really think about when they're thinking about volunteers. Oh, this person's gonna be great for the role, but then they're busy the entire time you need to plan. So it's one of those things to think about. So now, we have to figure out how to get them. So you have to recruit. One of the ways that you can recruit is you can be loud, you can be shouty, you can go to Twitter, you can announce at a camp that people are looking for volunteers, you can find them in an open call, you can pass the word around. Uh, there's all different kinds of ways to get the word out. And the next couple of examples I'm going to give you are sort of a uh, march up the ladder of, I think, effectiveness. Um, you will find people just by doing an open call, putting a web form on the internet and saying, come join me, you will find people that way, but they might not be the best. Um, there's other services that you can go to depending on how many people that you need to join your cause. Um, if you're doing like a race for the cure, you'll have people within your network who will just automatically sign up because that's what you do. Um, you'll also have people who just want to help but they don't really know about Drupal. They just know that they're kind of in the area and they'll be free that week. So um, the internet does help. Um, these volunteer matching services do help. Um, it's just a matter of getting the word out to the right people. Uh, at the end of the day, though, it's really you who need to make the volunteers happen. It's your project, so you need to have some personal accountability and responsibility into it. Um, so what I've done here is uh, show King Arthur from Monty Python's Holy Grail. And this is him going around to the different castles and trying to recruit people into, um, his, into his mission. So at the end of the day, like, you have to knock on some doors, you have to kiss some babies, you have to make it happen. Um, and this will go a long way. Like, if you put forth the effort, the effort will come back to you. Um, my favorite, though, out of all of them is the Have You Met Ted referral method. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with How I Met Your Mother, uh, How I Met Ted is a line that Barney Stinson uses uh, to introduce unsuspecting women to his friend Ted. Now, I'm not saying that volunteer is dating, but what I am saying is, is that someone comes to you who you trust, maybe you don't trust Barney Stinson necessarily, his reputation doesn't necessarily precede him, but if you have people in your network who you trust, maybe who you've worked with in the past, or who you've interacted in some way, and you know that person seems reliable, and then they recommend someone, because maybe they themselves can't do it, or maybe they're working with you already, and you just need extra hands. The referral me method for me has worked so much better than all the other methods out there, simply because if you're gonna get a roof put on your house, are you gonna go to Yelp, or are you gonna ask someone whose roof you've seen, and you know that it's a great roof? Something to think about. Um, when you have your list of prospects, uh, what I do is vet them, and this helps uh, save you some headache along the way. Um, setting expectations early with your um, volunteers gives them the chance of kind of understanding the entire scope of the project as well as you know it, but it also gives you a chance to figure out what the person's motivations are and what their availability is, and it, it's kind of your chance to get to know this person whom you're going to be working with. Um, and like I mentioned at the beginning, time is a huge factor. If they are not actually capable of helping you when you need the help, it might be a great fit, but that will derail your project. And a lot of you like deal with software and whatever, and you're used to the word blocker. I'm going to use blocker a lot in this because even if it's not the end of the world situation, it will prevent your project from moving forward, it'll kill your team's momentum, all kinds of things that you don't want to have happen when you're launching a project. So um, one of the things I like to do is ask them a couple questions. Um, what is it you're looking to get out of this? Uh, what do you think this job looks like? What kinds of things are you willing to contribute to this project? And then again, what's your time availability? And sometimes uh, they're not a great fit. So this is Jareth the Goblin King, King from uh, Labyrinth. Um, and this is a posting for a babysitter. And if you're a parent and you need to get your child taken care of, there's a couple things that you're gonna look for from a prospective babysitter. This is hopefully not one of them. So my point is, is that if you have the role, you have the volunteer, and maybe they're dedicated, maybe they're available, sometimes they're just not a great fit. And now it's gonna come an uncomfortable part for a lot of people. It's okay to say no. Um, one of the things that I've run into when I've talked to camp organizers in the past is you have people coming to you and they're very willing and willingness is a very valuable thing to have so it's very 
touchy to say thank you for this offer, but I'd rather not. Uh, and this is where it comes in of you don't have to say a hard no. It doesn't have to be no, buzz off. It can be a no, not at this time. It can be a no, thank you so much. Let's have you do something else that maybe doesn't deal with babysitting. Let's put you somewhere where you're not in charge of some giant thing that we're concerned about your skills, time, whatever. And it doesn't have to be specifically the person who's a bad person. It could just be a mismatch. And that's, I think, totally fine. So just practice saying no. And this will come back again um, as we talk through the slides. Um, after this point, my slides become somewhat cyclical because for me, the, the timeline of having a volunteer doesn't just start and stop. Um, it's a matter of cultivating it through the entire uh, iteration of the project or whatever. Because usually, like, take MidCamp, for example, there's going to be one next year. So this whole process will have to pick up and happen again. So we have our volunteers. We have our cauldron. We have our list of things that we want to have accomplish. Now what? This one is super important. When you come to an event and you're a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed volunteer, and all you want to do is contribute, and no one pays attention to you, and no one asks your name, and no one introduces you to anyone, and all they say is, go fold those t-shirts, are you going to come back? No. Because they don't care, so why do you? The first thing that I do when I, when I bring people onto a team is I introduce them. I say, hey, have you met Ted? And then I have them introduce themselves and share something about themselves. Or if, if you're going to send someone off to go do t-shirts, because folding t-shirts is a huge like, thing that needs to have happen, introduce them to their new t-shirt folding buddy. Hey, this is Bob. He's allergic to catfish. Now they have something to talk about. <laughs> And suddenly, you go from being an anonymous whoever to a human with a face. And in Fight Club, they say, in death, you have a name. Well, you know what? We're going to go a little bit earlier than that. In life, you have a name. Meet each other. Be friends. That's like one of the reasons that a lot of people go and volunteer in the first place is to make human connections. So work with that. That's good stuff. The other reason that we really push this is because um, when you know other people and you kind of have your idea of where you fit in the team, it suddenly becomes you and them to us. And I'm, I'll mention this a couple other times, but the whole point of team is to have us. So the more you can make us happen, the better off you are. The other thing about this is that it, it builds in an accountability to the team where you don't just have to tell so-and-so that you did a t-shirt, but you and Bob fold the t-shirt. It's like you have something to celebrate. Good job, you and Bob. So now that you have introduced yourselves and you have like a sense of connection and community, now you've got to get everybody in the boat. So this phrase, get everyone in the boat, is actually from Diana. She's the CEO of um, Amazie in, in Austin. And what it means is get everybody on the same page. You have where you need to be. You know how you're going to get there, more or less. Um, now just make sure that everyone actually agrees on that. And this is kind of a, a fun step that I've learned is that you assume that everyone's sort of on the same page during all of your different things because you've been working with them all one-on-one. -on -one. But now you have to introduce them to all the other people, and this is your chance to get them to vocalize. Well, why are you here? Because maybe what they tell everyone else is a little bit different, or maybe you heard it a little bit different. And this is also really good for building towards community. It gets everyone a chance to say, here's why I'm, I'm here, here's kind of what I want to see out of this. And it starts the conversation um, on the right foot of, it's OK to have open conversations. So um, the other thing about getting everybody on the, on the same page is that it sets the expectation of, we're all here together, we're all here to go move forward on this project, and um, getting everybody in step is a really important thing towards getting momentum on a project. Um, if you have someone who's not in the boat, uh, you'll notice it because they'll be swimming behind you or beside you or making a mess or whatever, but whatever they're doing, it's not part of the project, so all they have become is just a sideshow, and that's not really kind of what you're looking for. Um, the other thing is training, which is really important because along with the t-shirt example, like you can scale this to any level of involvement. If you don't give someone an idea of what they're supposed to do when they contribute, you're basically shooting them in the foot. So this would be the equivalent of if you tell someone to build a website, but you don't give them a computer, you just sort of tell them they have to build their own computer first. Why would you do that? So evolution is a great thing because we learn from mistakes and how to do things ahead of time, and that helps accelerate new progress. 
So you bring someone in, you train them for whatever task it is, how to fold a t-shirt, how to engage with a new set of volunteers when they show up to do the t-shirts. And you pass this level of training kind of up the chain. So when people come on, they already are that much more empowered so that they don't need a babysitter. Like you're adults, you have jobs, you're capable, obviously. I can give you some instructions and you can take it. That's all you need to do. Like you hired these people, you brought them on to, in, in your team, and if you don't give them some power to do something, then they're gonna feel inefficient and that will kill the team's momentum. So now you're on the boat. Um, this is what I said earlier about um, the open conversation. This is really important throughout the entire life cycle of the project because things will come up that suck. Things will come up that are awesome. People are not used to maybe having an open dialogue in their workplace or in their family life, but this place where they're coming together in their free time, give them that, but give them instructions on how to do it. When you talk in an open space, you have to be respectful. When you talk in an open space and someone has an idea, you don't call them an idiot. You need to be, uh, you need to be welcoming, you need to be warm, you need to be engaging, and you need to give people this idea that what they say matters because that goes towards empowering your volunteers and then you have happy volunteers. Because if you stifle people while they're contributing, it sort of ruins the momentum of their involvement and that can be a pain. Um, so I mentioned um, training before and I mentioned uh, rhythms and patterns before. Um, now it's time to kind of put that into practice. So you have your marching orders, you have your volunteers, you have what it is that you need to do, and now you need to figure out how to work together. So this is sort of like when the whatever hits the pavement. Now it's time to make it happen. Uh, so I've done seven DrupalCons. Of those seven DrupalCons, none of them has been planned the same. Um, which is not to say that we've reinvented the wheel each time because, oh my God, that would be a nightmare. But what it is is that each time you work with a new group of volunteers, you have a new dynamic. Everyone's gonna do something a little bit differently. And so if you're rigid and you go in and you say, this is exactly how we will do things for all of time forever, then people will be like, okay, well, I don't really like your game. I'm gonna go make my own game, and then they will. So what you wanna do is provide a framework and say, here's how we're gonna get there. Here's some things that we know to be a thing that works. Um, here's, a, here's some things that we know to be kind of in flux. So if you wanna like give input on those particular things, by all means, raise your hand. Um, and and it's, it's the chance for you to figure out who kind of is good at stuff while you're walking, because you might have you might have been interviewing them for maybe marketing, but the more that you work together, you find out that they're better maybe in this other area or in addition to this other area. So this is kind of when you get to work together and figure out the team's rhythm. Um, and this is really important for a variety of reasons. Mostly that it just gives them the idea of they're part of a big thing. And when you're a part of a big thing, you kind of want to have insight into all the different things that are happening kind of in addition to the thing that you're doing. Like you don't want to just know that you're building a giant blanket together. Like you don't want to see that you're doing like the red and blue thread together. You want to see the entire blanket. You want to see where your contribution matters. And this sort of comes into um, building the rhythm. So, um, yes. Now, leadership. So in order to have this team and have them keep momentum and have them producing all of this really awesome work, you need to have someone at the head of the team who kind of has it together. Um, whether it's organizational skills or motivational skills or whatever, they need to be able to not get stuck in the daily um, grind. They need to be able to keep focus on getting the boat to the island. Like that's the whole point. You're in the boat for a reason. Someone needs to make sure that you get there. One of the things that I've found to be really useful when dealing with volunteers who have bigger projects is to do frequent check-ins. Even if there's not a lot of stuff that happens between the check-ins, it's really useful to have those frequent meetings with the team so that they can see that there's momentum happening, even if it's not happening in something they're particularly working on. It just shows them that there's work still being done because not every day is gonna be something huge. And sometimes that's great because when you have stuff going on in your life, you don't want to be stressed out knowing that there's a million things due for a volunteer project that week. But being able to keep a cadence and um, have meetings and have check-ins and, and that kind of thing really, I think, helps um, keep the momentum and energy of the team going. Uh, one of the other things that I found really work well as a leader is um, when you are leading the team to whatever it is their next task or whatever will be, um, you can take the time to become one of them. Uh, one of the things that will break a team is uh, if you start doing the point and say you do that, 
you do that, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to be management. Management will break that us. It'll break it and turn it into, into management versus them, and you don't want that. So one of the things that I'm a huge proponent in is when the time comes, you need to get your hands dirty, which I've got a couple of different ways of looking at this. Get your hands dirty, but don't put yourself in a place where, as the leader, if something else that's a fire comes up, it breaks the process. So go towards that idea of putting the right people in places, get your hands dirty in a way that, that gives you flexibility to come out of that and help in other places. Okay. Um, and I think that's really important um, because it, it, it allows you to be in it, and I'm going to keep like driving this home even if I'm not quite getting the right words. Um, it allows you to be in it, but it, it keeps you from being bogged down in the little stuff. So. And one of the things that I am a huge proponent of is get shawarma. So this is a scene <laughs> from the Avengers. Um, if you've not seen the movie, what had just happened is an epic bad guy versus good guy battle where New York was in typical New York style obliterated by the baddies. Um, and during the fight, uh, one of them said to the other, I don't recall which, when we're done, we're getting shawarma. There's a really great shawarma place down the street. And sometimes that's all it takes, is, is when you're working with your team, sometimes it's going to suck, and sometimes you're going to have a really hard week, and sometimes you'll, maybe you'll get to the end of your project, and it doesn't feel like the ticker tape parade where everyone's outside celebrating how amazing you are. Sometimes all, it, all you can do is put your pants on and hope to God that you make it through the day. And the reason that it's super important to get shawarma with your team is that this helps you become a better team. You come together and you, you bond and you, you heal as a team and you figure out all the things that went wrong, you figure out all the things that went right, and you do it together. If they had just gone off and gone and licked their wounds away from each other, they would have lost that opportunity to come together and bond. Before this scene had happened, they were all individual mavericks who were super amazing on their own. After this scene, they were awesome. They were a team. So this is why I think it's super important. Pick your wins and celebrate them together. Now, <laughs> also celebrate externally. Um, celebrate the entire time that you're working on this project with your volunteers. If you're in the issue queues, thank people for their contributions. If you're finishing a project or you're finishing an event, announce at the end of the event, these people made this event happen. They're awesome because at the end of the day, they're doing it because they want to. There is a statistic that says people get more out of out of authentic praise than they do out of being paid. And that just brings me back to the whole point at the very beginning of they're doing it because they want to. And now you're doing the one thing that motivates most people more than money. So you're kind of winning, so don't screw it up. <laughs> but also make sure that you know your team when you go to celebrate because some people thrive when you push them on stage and you celebrate them. Some people would be mortified and wouldn't forgive you for years if you put them on stage. <laughs> Some people are totally satisfied with a tweet. Some people are not satisfied with a tweet. Some people would like a LinkedIn recommendation. Le Leslie Hawthorne um, is one of the um, community open source experts um, in the field, and she has a post about uh, let's all build a hat rack. You might have seen the acronym on Twitter. It's a giant acronym that doesn't make any sense unless you've read the blog post. But the point of it is, is that a lot of people contribute a lot. Like, as a lot of it, it happens behind the scenes, people don't notice, and some of the people who are doing the contributions aren't getting the public accolades or, or um, some sort of, of feedback or ROI, I guess, that this isn't really getting them where they want to be. And so her whole thing is, let's make your contributions more visible. When someone contributes a huge part to your project, give them a recommendation on LinkedIn, because maybe that recommendation can be usable towards them finding a job. Now, I look at this a little bit differently because I hate LinkedIn, so I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but what I would do is I would introduce other people. Like I, I would be a human connector. I'd say, hey, you worked with me, and I know that working with you, you're good at your job, or you're good at the idea of whatever, and I know that this person is looking for someone like that. Let's pair you guys up. Or I just know that you're a really fun person. This is a really fun person. You have a drinking buddy. Congratulations. These little things don't have to be necessarily a, like a paycheck at the end of it, but it's the little, the little bits of effort of you reaching out and saying, I know you did an awesome thing. Here's me acknowledging the awesome thing that you did in some way that'll make that person's little heart grow three sizes. So. 
also Oprah. <laughs> now comes the part that I think this is the reason that most of you came was the dedicated part of my um, presentation title. So yes, we have volunteers. Some of the volunteers need to put down chairs, some of them need to uh, fold t-shirts, some of them have bigger roles, some of them have even bigger roles. The ones that I really um, think make teams work are when um, volunteers come up out of the, the general warm bodies of volunteers and become real contributors. And this is a quote from Albus Dumbledore, who we all know is very amazing. Uh, this is for Harry, who was complaining, as he does, about um, how he didn't want to be this amazing, this powerful wizard who has all these dramatic problems, whatever. Um, <laughs> the point of it is, is, that, is that sometimes leadership is thrust upon you. And sometimes as a volunteer lead, I will thrust that leadership upon you. Not because I want you to be sad, but because I see potential in you to become something awesome. And I think a lot of the times when you're doing an event, these kind of people you'll see kind of pop up out of the woodwork. You'll see them when they stay later to do, to put the rest of the chairs away after the regulars have gone home. You'll see them um, staying and maybe taking notes in a, in, a, in a meeting that they had no reason to take the notes for. There was no reason for them to do it, but they did it because they chose to. And so these kind of people kind of bubble to the top. And you want to take those people and you want to hold them close to you forever because they're <laughs> awesome. Uh, this is Miss Frizzle from Magic School Bus. Miss <laughs> Frizzle has this idea of if you want to learn something, I'm not going to get in your way, but I will help you. And her whole thing is take chances, make mistakes, get messy. Because some people won't learn until you shove them in the deep end. And some people, it's, it goes back to that same thing. If you need to know your team, because some people, if you throw in the deep end, they will never come back. And so you want to figure out a different way to maybe bring them in. They might require a little bit more hand-holding. Um, other people just need to be told, I think you're really good at that. Maybe you should just do that. And that little bit of um, connection will kind of bring them across. Um, with, with volunteering, it's very difficult to tell a volunteer what to do. It's instead easier to let them kind of find out on their own what makes them happy. because. Odds are, if you are not a professional volunteer, you don't really know all the different things that are out there to do. So it's just a matter of kind of picking up all the different toys and figuring out which one fits in your hand the best. And this is where mentorship comes in. Um, when, you have <laughs> when you have volunteers, one of the things that will go towards cultivating a really strong leader within a group of volunteers is mentorship. Um, it's one thing to provide training, but it's another thing to provide the one-on-one -on -one coaching of I have a question or maybe you didn't think about this. Um, let, me, let me help you get somewhere awesome. And when you have this in the volunteer world, I think this is pretty great. Um, this is Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. Um, most of the things that he says are filled with um, mostly accurate, but a side of what? as you can see, uh, but he's actually a great mentor. He's a reluctant mentor. Um, he mentors um, April, who's one of the office uh, employees, and um, he's helped her become a better uh, professional, better grow. She's, he's helped her grow in ways that he was never wanting to. He just happened to be good at it, and so he became, culti he became cultivated into becoming a good mentor. Like I said, you still have to take a grain of salt with the things that he says, but at the end of it, like, you'll get there. Um, but mentorship is valuable. Um, it goes towards the idea of you can't do everything by yourself and you don't want to do everything by yourself. And you also don't want to make it so that you're reliant in too many areas so that if you get hit by the magic school bus, that something falls apart. So one of the reasons that we really want to cultivate these kinds of people is the more people who learn how to do things and the more people who step up to do things, the, the more cushion and buffer that you have to pass off responsibility. And being able to pass off responsibility to another human who you trust is so good for the soul because you don't have to have that on your shoulders anymore. So that's why I was very excited about the idea of finding people who are really good at these things and who want to do them because they will make your life as an, as an event planner, as a some kind of community, whatever. They'll make your life so much better. And now I'm back to the listening part. So before we created a culture of um, open conversation and open dialogue and I'm going to bring that back because this is very important. When you have people that you sort of move up the volunteer chain, you want to also acknowledge them 
by providing more of a uh, platform to be heard. So it's one thing for someone on the internet to tell you that you're stupid. It's another thing for someone who you know and trust to tell you, well, maybe we should do this other thing because whatever. They're more invested, they've probably seen it from an angle that you haven't, and odds are they have a really good idea. So we wanna cultivate that whole idea of bring new ideas to the surface. Tell me things that we can do, that I can do, that the team can do to get better at whatever it is that we're doing. Um, and this is great for so many reasons. And even if you only take it from the stance of um, just hear them, this is such, such an important thing to just understand. Just hear them. And if you don't, they'll do what Patton did. Uh, Patton was a guest on uh, Parks and Rec, and the city was going to pass a bill that he did not agree with. Now normally, in your, when you're working with a team, um, these kinds of things will bubble up much sooner than this, and you would be able to talk about that in an open way and kind of get it out of the way so that it doesn't become explosive. But in this particular case, it did not. And so Patton showed up, and he filibustered the bill. And the way that he filibustered the bill was giving an eight-minute um, unscripted uh, pitch for J.J. Abrams' new Star Wars, and it is epic. If you would like the link, I can share the YouTube link with you after, but it is something to behold. Basically, he forced his way in uh, to the dialogue because the dialogue was close to him. So learn from them and do not do that. Make this very open place where people are encouraged to bring ideas to you. One of the examples that I have where this worked out really well um, is community voting for DrupalCon was brought by people who were track chairs who said this is really confusing. The process is broken to have this expectation to the community that if they vote on sessions that they'll get in versus if we select the sessions and that there was this like this head hitting of well, we're not really sure where our job ends and their job begins and it's just confusing. So we got rid of community voting and guess who complained? Nobody. Because we listened, and when you listen, good things happen. Another example of listening is labs. Um, labs are back-to-back -back sessions, basically mega sessions if you've been to bad camp. Um, and our track chairs said, well, you know, we like a lot of these sessions, but you can't get the momentum, you can't get the, the oomph of knowledge that you're really looking for in just an hour. So let's make an Uber session. And so we said, hooray. And then there were labs. And people were happy. So this is, it's good to listen because one of the things that I've learned is you don't know everything. I mean, I pretend that I do, but I don't. We don't know everything, and that's why we keep really smart people around us because combined, we know quite a few things, and that's already ahead. Um, <laughs> now for the sadness. Volunteer burnout sucks. <laughs> and one of the things that I would uh, caution you strongly against is to not create a culture where burnout is the only escape route. Uh, instead, what I like to do is create lots of exits. Um, not in a way of come work for us and then buy, but work for us and I will listen to your, your life situations, I'll listen to you about your job things, I'll care about your workload, and we'll make it so that if you leave, the whole project will come crumbling down. Because a lot of projects have that one person where if they don't show up and do their thing, something will break. And odds are that person knows that. And that person feels that. And it makes that person so reluctant to raise their hand and say, I can't play this time. I'm, I gotta step back. And when that happens, you've already created that sense of burnout and kind of helplessness in that person. And it's only a matter of time before that person just doesn't show up one day. And then they just don't show up again. And, then suddenly they're not answering emails, and then they're not getting Christmas cards. So what you want to do is a couple things. First of all, encouraging that open place of listening, um, and then also relying on having backups. Um, having a net and a network of people who can also do this person's job, I think is a luxury. So I, I, I understand that not everyone will be able to do this but it is an ideal state and we should all aspire to an ideal states because it makes everyone's life a lot easier. So in DrupalCon, we have globals. And globals are people who've done this before. And the whole idea of this is, if you can't do it, person who's currently doing it, there is a whole long line of people who can do this. Don't feel like I'm pushing you out the door because there's a whole long line of people. Instead feel like, look at all those people 
who if I can't make the meeting can step in for me. Look at all those people who if I don't want to ask Stephanie how she did it because she didn't particularly do this one thing, let's go ask them because there's seven people who've done it before. And that I think makes it so much easier for the volunteer to both feel empowered, like they have ownership of their role. They also have mentors who they can go reach out to for, I'm in a situation where I don't really know what to do and kind of just want to bounce an idea off someone else. Um, and then they also have the idea of, well, maybe if I back out this one time, there's other people who can fill in for me. And from what I've heard and seen, this works wonders. And now when I go to people and say, we have DrupalCon whatever coming up, do you want to play with me? What they'll say is, I can't, or yes, when does the planning start? And that's an awesome place to get to, to be able to have people outright say no, but ping me next time, or yes, let's do this, and realizing that they just did this three months previously, like not a lot of time to get a new suntan. It's good stuff. The other thing is, it creates a sense of, and I mentioned this a little bit, but it, it creates a sense of trust in the team of, um, you guys have my back. And that, I think, goes a long way when you're dealing with volunteers. It goes towards that idea of community and inclusivity, and it's all one big happy family, and that is good stuff. Now we go into the other bad thing, tending your garden. So each time that you kick up a project or you like go into a new thing of planning or you're dealing with contributors in the issue queues, you're gonna have to kind of redo the recruiting and vetting process each time. Because even if someone came onto your team and they were awesome, maybe they just weren't able to continue being awesome or maybe life got in the way or whatever. Maybe your idea and their idea of what, how, the way that things should be differed somewhere along the line. Or maybe that person, for whatever reason, decided to have a really bad year and take it on everyone. And sometimes that does happen. I've talked to many camp organizers who have found themselves working with an awesome team, except for that one guy. But I don't know how to make him stop, and he's not going to stop on his own, but I can't fire him because he's done this for like four years. What do you do? Well, you have to tend your garden. Because if you don't get rid of that one person who's making everybody else unhappy, you're going to lose everybody else who's unhappy, and you're going to keep the guy who makes everybody unhappy. And it's not easy. It goes back to the whole thing of it's OK to say no, but it's not going to be easy to say no. And so figuring out how to best work through that with your team is something to work on. And I'm going to leave you with this quote from Amy Fuller, Fuller, who's a very, very smart woman. Find a group of people who challenge and inspire you. Spend a lot of time with them, and it will change your life. No one is here because, of what they did, because they did it on their own. The point of this is, back to the whole stone soup idea, everyone's going to bring whatever it is that they can give. Their odds are they're going to be super good at it, or they're going to learn to be really good at it. And all you have to do is just be willing to let it happen around you, and awesome, awesome things are going to happen. These are my resources. <laughs> and that's it. Yay. Cool. Do we have questions? Because I was very vague. Can you go back to your resources? <laughs> They're linkable. <laughs> Check-ins, you know, constant, you know, having uh, well, frequent check-ins. Uh, we have any strategies for uh, doing so when it's very hard to schedule uh, for volunteers if everyone has all their crazy different schedules and, and sometimes the schedules. So you know, one day these you know, people out. This actually happens with like social groups as well. And, and how to uh, to accomplish the same check-ins with when you have that situation. <coughs> cool. So Matthew had a good question about um, how you schedule check-ins and keep that momentum when scheduling is super, super hard because people. <laughs> and I have a thing that works for me, it doesn't necessarily work for everyone else, is you sneak something onto the calendar and then you, what you do is before each meeting is over, you confirm the next time you're going to meet and that sort of pre-sets it. It also builds in some flexibility. Depending on your social life and your people that you interact with, some people work really well knowing that they've got board games Wednesday night at 5. 
some people that will destroy them because they've got board games every third Wednesday and then something else every second Wednesday and that'll break it. Um, so what you can try is the scheduling before the meeting's over and that will build in some accountability of, hey, we all looked around the room, we all looked at our calendars and everyone was free. So we're gonna meet in three weeks and we're gonna be okay with it. And that's so far has worked pretty well for me. Um, what we also do with um, with the, the teams in DrupalCon is kind of give them a, uh, you're able to meet and then if you're not able to meet, have your global step in for you. And that way, even if you're not able to meet, then that knowledge isn't lost into the air. Like hopefully they'll meet afterwards and kind of check in. Um, also creating notes and agendas is a huge pain in the ass, but it goes a long way of keeping the record. And none of these things are easy. So if they don't work, uh, but yeah. More, no. Okay. Oh, one in the back. Sorry. Yep. Uh, so just thinking about this, so uh, the capacity in which I would do a volunteer post office is the capacity of Drupal game, in which case everyone's volunteer, which is totally, you know, like all of us are coming in some ways that are very equal. And so uh, just thinking about the, the issue of challenging personalities, when you have someone who's, you know, able to like sort of like I'm organizing for another affair, so very geeky, like you, you maybe have the ability to say no a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. This is just like half form question thought, and I'm wondering if you've got any insights. Like when your when your power dynamics were all volunteers, um, and yet maybe somebody needs to be talked to. Mm -hmm. uh, how to address that? Okay. So Drew's question was how to deal with conflicting personalities when someone is mm -hmm. asserting their conflicting personality. Um, so I've seen this done a couple ways, and you're right, from DrupalCon, it's not really applicable because at the end of the day, I could be like, you're booted. Um, but in Drupal, in um, in Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon, the, the user camp or the user group um, sets in certain checks along the way so that one person doesn't become more, uh, I guess, legacy than everyone else. And so every year they rotate out their main lead of the, the group so that no one ever has that idea of, well, I've been doing this for two years, so I'm awesome. Um, another way of doing it is, um, it's like when you're working with your, your team at work or you, you have a tech lead, going in and setting the expectation of, this person in this particular whatever is going to be the lead of this group so that we can get things done. Um, I think will help everyone kind of do that whole we're all buying in, we're all looking around the room, yes, you're in charge, awesome, that person leads the meeting, that person has a little bit more say. Um, but then it comes back to that idea of if this person has a conflicting personality in the way that it's actually preventing anyone and everyone else is agreeing, but it's preventing that from actually being able to set up a rhythm, then someone is going to have to be the bad guy and that's where it comes in uh, that's where I when I said it's okay to say no like I it, this is very difficult it's not easy um, sometimes you have to do like the power of three and come to the person and say hey separately from maybe the entire group and say hey we're noticing you're not really playing well in the playground with the other kids let's talk about it and usually that conversation will at least get the conversation out in the air versus letting it continue to fester with this person unchecked. And if it goes above that, then I'm not really sure. Because I know that there's groups who have that power of personality who makes it not fun to play on the playground. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in the beginning, you talk about how important it is uh, to get everybody feeling like the current one team, yeah. um, especially when more teams are kind of distributed, especially with this on camp thing. Yep. So do you have any suggestions on how they were distributed, how they get them feeling all connected? That's a really good question. Uh, so the question was, how do you get distributed teams to feel like they're part of the big team? Yeah. Um, so that's really good. Um, it depends on your level of, I think, for figuring out within the team how much they want to know from the big picture. So in DrupalCon, we had a marketing team, we had a production team, we had a website team, we had um, the program team, we had another team, whatever. But a lot of them worked independently. And it was sometimes best to just kind of keep them working as a team. Um, one thing that worked really well is to have the leads come together and establish kind of a lead team and then bring that information back to the rest of their teams and sort of try and keep that loop of communication going so that it, we tried, like I understand that like having one person be the voice for the team can get a little bit problematic, especially because it's telephone and stuff like that, but it does go a little bit towards building that open communication of, hey, the marketing team is doing this, let's pick it up and take it over to the, the programs team. 
Um, as far as getting everyone together, it's really difficult because like on a DrupalCon level, you're dealing with about 70 people. And so it's really hard to get everyone on a phone call to like all wave at each other, um, which is one of the reasons that we do the volunteer dinner at the end. We say, hey, look at all the people that you didn't realize you were working with, but you are, and now meet each other. And that's kind of how we get around that, but that is really difficult. Yeah. Uh, any tips on how to motivate uh, people who have committed to do something and they're just kind of falling flat? And you don't necessarily want to lose them, but you're not, they become a block. So Kevin's question is, how do you deal with people who you would like to encourage to continue the thing that they've committed to, but they, for whatever reason, are not? And usually, what I have found, and this is a really sucky answer, uh, is that if they can't, and they are a blocker, you have to cut them. And it might just be a matter of they really wanted to, and you're gonna find someone who really does wanna help, but it goes back to that whole idea of time. And if they are not able, and they are a blocker, you find someone else or you're going to end up doing it yourself anyway. But preferably, like, don't do it the 11th hour because you said, nah, they're not going to show up. Let's, mm, that's bad. So, not a good answer because it's, it's hard. No. Anyone else? Cool. Let's go get cookies. Yeah.